questions. My name's Caitlin Ferris. Um, I'm a member of Quorum Chambers uh, and I'm joined by my co-host Victoria Roberts, a very experienced uh, child protection lawyer. And uh, we are very, very grateful to Matthew Vigiri, uh, a children's guardian, who's come to offer us um, some uh, pretty unique insights um, into see the frontline service provision. Um, but before I carry on, what I am going to ask everybody to do is please can everyone mute your audio settings? So, um, yeah, the rustling of newspapers and the drinking of tea will make me very nervous. Um, and also, I need everybody to be aware that this webinar is being recorded. So, uh, in that knowledge, please adjust your settings as you see fit, but uh, do be aware of that. Um, that means you can turn off your video if you want to. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> you don't have to be recorded in your PJs, best time. Um, and just also to let you know, we are inviting questions by way of the chat function. Um, and you can do that, as I understand it, by just writing. Uh, and then we are going to have those moderated by uh, Rakaya, who is um, waiting there to look at those and take them. And at the conclusion of our presentation, we will obviously take your questions and answer what we hope um, we will be able to uh, chat function. Um, this is the second of our quorum webinars. Uh, we had a very successful one last week, which I understand is uh, available. Um, and we have a rolling program effectively that we are uh, looking to um, put together over the next few weeks. Please, can you look out for our next one? We think it's probably about a fortnight. It will be on our Twitter feed uh, and you'll be able to access it through the um, Eventbrite service as you do uh, this one. Um, so yeah, have a look out for that. Um, and also importantly, can I remind uh, everyone that we are supporting the National Emergency Trust um, who are engaged in such invaluable work at this time of crisis. So, Please do, if you feel able, um, contribute. Again, the details are on the invitation. Um, so where are we at? Well, <clears throat> everybody knows that we're in the midst of a crisis. Um, and as a consequence of that, we have tried to put together some topics that we hope are apposite. Um, I'm gonna try and share my screen. This may all end hideously badly, but let's try. Um, so yeah, so there we are. We've got... Um, uh, remote hearings technology, documents and bundling, how to involve lay parties and the vulnerable, conducting assessments, child protection during COVID-19 uh, and a general uh, subject around risks outside the court arena. Um, I should say that uh, Victoria and I have a, a particular specialism uh, in representing local authorities and we had considered initially that we would open it up uh, only to them but Obviously, we're so delighted that there's been um, this level of interest, but I should probably um, make it clear that there is a slant towards um, that client group. Um, but we hope everyone will find it interesting and listen, if it's not, there's still time to catch the end of Bargain Hunt. So, um, you know, one of the joys of, of working from home. So um, I'm going to, uh, if I may, just uh, crack on with um, report remote hearings and technology. Um, a lot of this is uh, really assimilating the information that we were offered by the recent guidance from McDonald J. Um, and what he says there is that we must not lose sight of our primary purpose as a family justice system, which is to enable courts to deal with cases having regard to welfare issues, the overriding objective, part of which is to ensure that parties are on an equal footing uh, and in pushing forward to achieve remote hearings this must not be at the expense of a fair and just process plan remains keep business going safely so i ask with a quizzical face um has that happened um 
And we know obviously that since the 16th of March, the social distancing measures were implemented. And my experience is pretty much that next week, everything got pulled, um, other than applications for emergency protection orders, interim care orders, and IRHs, they're all pulled. So um, that was certainly my experience. And, and, and I think certainly, uh, colleagues um, and anecdotal uh, information is that that is still going on. If you have a case in your diary uh, that is longer than an ICO and EPO, then it's being pulled. Uh, and what we found is that then um, one of the days is being used as a direction. So um, I just thought it might be helpful to put together um, what I think is helpful at the current time to consider when approaching one of those directions hearings. Frankly, you're not gonna know how long these situations, the interim is going to be. We have no idea. So my suggestion is that when you approach those, you have the following in mind. Be well prepared for these directions hearings. They're going to be a holding position for simply an unknown length of time, but it's gonna be long. Um, have a safeguarding plan in place children are at home, how are they to be monitored? You're gonna use Skype, FaceTime visits. What are you going to do to allow for your child protection? Uh, if there's gonna be written agreements, provide them to parents, solicitors well in advance, make them in plain English. Again, you don't know how long are these are gonna to have to last for. And in addition, if there are sanctions, you need to make those explicit. Parents are in residential settings, mother and baby placements. How is the pandemic affecting that assessment, the placement itself? Be vigilant about when and how placements are likely to be at risk, disruption meetings, uh, and clear contingency planning. Um, be clear about contact proposals. How are you going to promote them? We know that all contact centres have no shot. So the only mechanism is clearly a remote one uh, and a clear thought needs to be given to how you're gonna manage that. How are the parents to be supported uh, with this? And we will talk a little bit more um, about what measures can be put in place, particularly in terms of uh, late lights and vulnerable. Um, and consider at this stage, whether or not there's any need for further evidence. Um, don't get caught out um, when this, when our bottleneck finally, um, passes through. Um, think about family finding. Um, can you seek directions potentially to consider advertising? Don't let that sit in abeyance. Um, and is this a time when you could actually <laughs> flush out um, family members that may have been assessed negatively? Because the last thing you want is after this sort of time uh, lag and delay, you find yourself with um, family members popping up um, at the last minute. Make sure that you keep all the professionals in the loop, that you are involving everybody as fully as possible. Consider um, obviously virtual invitations to LAC meetings and how to support people with this. Um, simply put, use the time wisely. Um, the other thing that I'd noticed from the guidance is my suggestion to local authorities, but perhaps uh, all parties. Um, McDonald asked that courts keep a clear record of all of the cases that are effectively being shunted out of the list. Uh, and I would suggest keeping uh, a careful note um, of those cases. They're obviously going to get more and more um, urgent as we move along. But if once measures relax, local authorities are in a position to make a compelling argument for a particular case to be heard uh, as swiftly as the relaxations take place, then um, I think you would be um, well advised to keep this running record and make your case as soon as you possibly can. Um, and the other thing that obviously with the pulling of cases, if you don't agree with it being removed from the list, if you are going to make a case that it should be heard, that there's a way to hear it. Um, certainly the guidance I'd seen from uh, Robin Tolson is that when cases are pulled, you can, and I say should, uh, approach the DFJ locally. Um, you can obviously write to um, the judge that was meant to be hearing it. Uh, there should be a protocol in place 
to look to challenge what has been this root and branch removal um, of uh, cases other than those that I've mentioned. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to do that. Um, so gonna think about, oops, I don't know, um, so remote platforms, uh, as things have evolved, we've all been straining to implement new technology. Um, and we've had to have a weather eye on anything approaching business as usual with fairness and accessibility. Now, um, McDonald's used the word smorgasbord, which whilst nice to say, I haven't got a clue what it is, I suspect it involves fish and migrate, so you know what. Let's go with a much more familiar image of the pick and mix. Mm. So um, what he says is there is no one size fits all. He invites courts, practitioners, local authorities, the judiciary to literally consider on a case by case basis what best suits uh, the welfare needs and work fairness requirements. So um, I'm going to endeavor to put together a, a, an overview of those. But I would recommend very highly um, a very techy, um, hands-on, uh, accessible uh, webinar that's being provided by the Family Law Bar Association through the ARC. That is a rolling program and you can get that um, very, very hands-on um, uh, information. So first up, Skype and Skype for Business. Um, it's the default video app for the judiciary, it's loaded on their laptops, um, there's user-friendly guidance, staff are trained, uh, and it's tried and tested. Um, anecdotal evidence suggests that the best way to use it is for the lead legal representative to set it up inviting the judge. Um, they have undertaken quite lengthy hearings, complex ones, um, uh, end of life decisions, and uh, it's certainly, I think, one that is more familiar to us as lawyers and indeed to uh, our lay clients and our professional clients. It's easy to install um, and there's now this concomity between Skype and Skype for Business on the uh, judicial um, laptops and indeed uh, their equipment. But there have been problems, and I understand they've mainly been around uh, recording uh, and the uh, corruption that I think has been found after a, a certain period of time. But I, I think this is um, likely to be the main runner uh, as we go forward in terms of the uh, audio, sorry, the video apps. Um, Kinley Cloud, ignore that, it's pretty much. Uh, the criminal bods only. They haven't managed to get it out to us and I don't think it's much of a, a, a one at all. Microsoft Teams, similarly, as I understand it, you need a group subscription. And if it's difficult for us as um, barristers to be able to accessing it, I can only imagine how difficult it is for lay clients and, and rolling that out, I don't think it's gonna be an option. Um, Zoom, well, I'll be honest, uh, I just think it's it's an extraordinary platform. Um, here we are, we you can host up to a thousand participants. And listen, if, if we can get in, then you know what? So can our clients, so can um, the Jude, I mean, everybody, we can all get in. So um, I am disappointed that it's not become the uh, video of choice. Um, it's got the other benefit, you can have breakout rooms, you can allow for um, obviously taking instructions. But as I understand it, the difficulty is that the judiciary, that the MOJ laptops don't have Google Chrome and you have to have that platform to be able to get onto Zoom. And this seems to be the wall that's been hit uh, in relation to rolling this out. Um, I know that McDonald J is very keen on this. He's put it as part of a task for subcommittees. So um, watch this space, but at the moment it doesn't seem to be gaining the ground, certainly that I as a practitioner would have wished it to do. Um, something that I'm rather proud of in the um, Annex 3 of uh, McDonald's guidance, he actually records all of the um, platforms available 
uh, set by set in terms of chambers. Uh, and Quorum is one of six that is able to offer the Zoom facility. Uh, and I would suggest that you do bear that in mind when thinking about the appropriate nature of hearings and how you can argue your case. Um, finally, BT Meet Me, yawn. Um, it's the default audio app. Uh, there are user guides that exist if people want them I can send them round uh, but my experience with these they're just extraordinarily straightforward they simply put their tempo in hearings the judge rings you uh, rings the parties then you have uh, ground rules introductions and you take your turns um, I understand that the CFC this is the only way they're conducting hearings there is nothing else. Um, Barnet, I think the same, can't speak for West London, but London-wide, it seems within the M25, this is the way they're doing hearings. And I, my personal view is they are inherently unfair. Uh, they are nothing like the recreation of the feeling or the engagement or the accessibility of a courtroom hearing and McDonald Joe is very clear that was what we were trying to do so um, I don't know why I don't know why people aren't able to roll this out but at the moment these have been the only types of hearings I've had today I'm going to obviously ask Victoria and Matt for their um, experience but thus far this is all I've had and I know that Robin Tolson is seeking feedback on how these hearings are being managed uh, and if I get asked I'll tell them I think they're inherently unfair they're just not nobody leaves feeling like they've had a, a fair hearing so um effective hearings my top tips um please allow for a conference with your clients um it's so important in advance of remote hearings just to have a flavour of what to expect. Um, have those, um, yes, I, when I'm um, drafting orders, I look for listing advocates meetings a good four or five working days in advance of the hearing themselves. So have your con in advance of that. Decide how you're gonna do it, WhatsApp, FaceTime, whatever. Um, be well prepared for your advocates meetings. They're increasingly important. We're told to look at them collaboratively, go through the matters in issue. I mean, it all sounds bloody obvious, but in current times, um, really we are stressing just how important it is to be able to hone down on those issues. Local authority lawyers must, must, must uh, prepare a comprehensive draft order, a full 24 hours uh, in advance of the hearing. They're just essential to be able to the judiciary to make these decisions, particularly when they lose an exam. So um, ensure that they're circulated, pleaded properly. Please though, the caveat to this is that we can only do this if instructions are received in good time. And that is the same for any um, of uh, the parties that we represent. Um, Lastminute.com is just going to make uh, life so much harder. Um, and I also have found that having a very quick chat or even a, a FaceTime before, as, as an advocate, before you join the um, hour slot in advance of the hearing, again, is helpful. You can get questions answered that have been asked in the uh, advocates meetings. Um, and I, again, I think it's helpful just to make everyone aware of what it is that they're likely to be doing in a remote hearing. Um, try and maintain an open channel of communication whilst you're actually um, doing the hearing. Let's face it, we've all been there on texting, WhatsApping. Um, and finally, what is it that local authorities and parents solicitors can do to assist families and indeed litigants in person to engage in remote hearings? Consider offering top-ups for uh, phone credits. Um, I mean, no one's paying for, for travel because there isn't any. So it may be that there's a, a mechanism for that. Um, Donald Jay had suggested that the courts create what he's termed a plain English guide for parents and families, uh, preparing them for remote hearing, step-by-step -step guidance, pictures, how to connect, download apps. I would suggest that that is a very sensible proposal for local authorities. 
um, to look at preparing how they can best help uh, and support um, vulnerable families uh, involved in this process. Um, think about Simone Mobiles, low cost options, Zoom, WhatsApp. Um, and this next point, there's Dorset Council was very much lauded for um, setting up a space, a remote um, uh, uh, facility that allowed um, families to involve themselves. But I, I don't know how they've done it simply put so it may be that there are um, boroughs that can do that find the safe spaces uh, for remote facilities um think about how people can help if a hearing is taking place at home and there's children there can they just be taken into another room by relatives think about that sort of thing uh, and be clear about expectations of uh, conduct during remote hearings um i mean anything that you can do in advance is likely to uh, minimise delay and, and uh, obviously make that a hearing as effective as you possibly can. Um, I'm pretty sure that's all I've got to say on this, but I would be very grateful to hear from uh, Victoria and Matt in relation to their um, experience of the remote working. Uh, hi, I was just going to say I've done a few Skype for business hearings and they're generally fine. I know colleagues have done Zoom. Um, I think part of the problem is that some people think Zoom isn't safe or secure um, and so some, I'm told by the FLBA that the um, ICO has said that Zoom's all right. Key thing is we mustn't use their cloud for any recording. You've got to record to your own device and your own GDPR compliant cloud um, and make sure you've got the password. I think Zoom actually have changed a lot of their default settings so that they're more compliant now. Um, Skype. Uh, is clunky but and has some advantages such that you can spotlight the person giving evidence so that um, that can help another useful tool is your whatsapp can you can add it to your desktop so as a web and um, so you access it through chrome or whatever that can be really handy if that's what you're using to communicate with your social worker or your lay client during the hearing because rather than looking at your phone it will be on your um your laptop essentially so that's a good way of keeping in touch the other thing is there's a couple of useful links. Um, it's a Lawyer's Life has um, um, a list of what local courts are doing. It's not quite up to date. I think it's not got, or as of yesterday, it didn't have the CFC's latest from the 6th of April, and it hasn't got the Essex and Sussex DFJ guidance on it. But it's a useful guide as to what's Barnet doing, what's Croydon doing. Um, and also there's a daily update um, by HMCTS um, on what courts are open and not. Um, I haven't done um, a handout, but I'm happy when Caitlin's get sent round, I can send around all these links, but they're useful places to have a look. That's all I had to add on this section. I know Matt did yeah. a Zoom hearing. Um, you can, everyone hear me, you hear me, Victoria? Fine. Yep. Yeah. Um, obviously, just quickly, I'm a public law guardian in, in the East London team. Um, so I'm going to be talking from that kind of experience and, you know, I'm not representing Kafkas in general, but I can give you some updates from Kafkas that I know of. Um, East London, we're doing everything on the telephone, um, the, the, the one that Caitlin was talking about last. And I think I agree with a lot of what she said in terms of you, preparation is really key. Um, and it's worked pretty effectively with quite simple CMHs or simple first hearings. But I haven't, you know, I can't see how it can work sort of beyond that anything more complicated than that and I I know in one of our I think it might have been a CMH that the, the lay clients were on the phone and they spoke out you know and because they you know it's not the same as being in the court and I think you can't see on zoom or, or a visual thing it's a bit a bit more organized and you might you might be a bit quieter or you might not you might know not to speak out so I think there are some problems I would agree one of the key things is preparation be really really prepared um because then when you when the judge phones you in on one of these telephone calls you can just get the things done quickly uh, my fear is if there was some kind of disagreement during that hearing is having to ring out and then the judge at the moment the the judges are calling everyone in so it's kind time consuming for the judge um i've done a zoom hearing in the high court with um mostin jay and he's very keen on zoom he really took control of it 
Um, it worked really well. There was a litigant in person. It was a, it was all done on submissions. I think it's a published um, judgment on Bailey, so you can you can send that round later. But I mean, it was helpful because the the, the person representing themselves is very tech savvy, so he was able to phone in, and Mostyn controlled it, and it worked it worked really well. But I'm aware that Zoom has some potential security issues, and I think the high court is using it, whereas the the lower courts don't seem to be able to use it. But I, I mean, if I had to plump for one, and it's something I only heard about three weeks ago, I'd go for Zoom. Um, we, uh, we use Skype for business at Kafkas to do our meetings. So I, I don't know whether I haven't been involved in any of those, but I think um, it is about, it's about preparation. I think having a, being able to text your barrister, you know, I, in my head in a remote hearing, I just treated it like a proper hearing and I was quiet. And instead of passing a note to my solicitor or my barrister, I was texting them. So I think that's the way I mentally prepared for doing the hearings as a guardian. I just thought it's as if I'm in court and I had to obviously keep my children and dog quiet and things like that, which is, which is quite hard. Well, I did actually stick the listing of the high court on my door so no one could come in and I had a blissful four hours without anyone disturbing me I think that's all I've got to add there okay and the next topic is documents and bundling which I'm going to cover and it's a pretty dry um, area so I'm going to try and keep that bit brief I'm going to get particularly, <laughs> particularly as most of us um, in this field have the luxury um, of local authorities preparing bundles using fancy bundling software. Um, if you're interested in this, I big plug for the FLBA training. I think they did that for the ALC um, on Monday, but I think there's going to be a rerun of it or potentially a video available, and there's certainly some handouts. Um, but they've done a hell of a lot of work, and I recommend that. Um, really, if we're going to be doing this remotely, you're going to need two devices. Um, if you're going to join a hearing, access a bundle, keep a note. Um, and get texts or email instructions or what have you. Um, we're going to, at some point, this COVID crush is gonna, we're gonna have to deal with it. And so courts are gonna have to get the PDF bundle. And I know at East London, that's one of the issues. They can't open egress and only some people have case lines. Um, and so I think, how do we get to grips with actually getting your PDF bundle to a judge um, when they're huge? But, uh, Whereas I think in the past, when a bundle's gone missing, it's somewhere in a room, um, I've handed up my iPad um, and we can't do that. But we're going to have to sort of make do. Um, and I think core core bundles of, abs of what is really necessary for the hearing is what we're going to go. Um, I think we have to think about how lay parties are going to get access to the bundle and query, do they need it? Um, a lot of the time, if you're in court, the lay party doesn't have its own whole bundle, but there is at least facility for them to look at yours and read key documents. Um, there's going to need to be a way for them to see the document you're referring to if they're giving evidence. And that's where I think Zoom and some of the other um, video platforms are reasonably good because you can share your screen. And so um, and you need to decide in advance, what are you reading out? What are you going to show? Um, at the moment, I think some LAs don't have bundling software or they haven't got it remotely or they can't get into the office to scan things. And so I thought it might be helpful to talk about what you can actually do um, to make your own bundle or to help out um, if you're either the LA or you might be the applicant, if you're, um, for example, um, applying for discharge of a care order, how do you set your bundle up? Um, bundle Docs is one I think, web program. Um, I'm not sure if it's GDPR compliant. I'm going to do their um, webinar because I think they operate it through, it's a web service rather than a download. And I need to check that there's a GDPR compliant cloud. But you don't necessarily need um, bundling, sort of the big bundling software for what, just to get us through this time. As long as you've got the documents electronically, um, you can create a bundle. So um, you can scan things if, you, um, if you've got a scanner at home, but if not on your phone, um, I think query, just check that your app that you're using is all right and this cam scanner on android had a problem last year um, and you just need to check regularly that you're not accidentally storing stuff that you've scanned on your phone into a cloud that it shouldn't be on um, but otherwise scanning on your phone or scanning from your um tablet is fine just to get you a get you a document that was um into an electronic format 
if you need to turn documents into PDFs, most laptops you can do that on, but if you don't have software, for example, with a Word document, if you go to print it, you can check save as PDF rather than choosing a printer. Um, the key software that most of the bar is using is either Adobe Pro DC or PDF Expert. Um, Adobe Pro DC is more Windows based, but you can get it for Mac. You can merge documents to make a bundle. You can reorder and extract pages. You can do proper numbering, sort of ABC, and, and then the, and the pagination. Although it's best to do <clears throat> that in the sections, sort of do all your section A's in one go before you merge it. And that gives you searchable pagination. You can do full redaction. The best thing about it is the, the OCR, which is optical character recognition or reader. And that converts the text in so that it's searchable. Um, so if you have a document um, that you, that's sort of typed, for example, but you load it into the OCR and it makes it readable to the your PDF viewer, so you could search for the word and the um, injury or um, fracture, and so that would all pop up, and that's really useful. It can also protect your document so it's not easily amended or copied. Um, and if you work paperlessly, Adobe um, has lots of function in terms of how you do your marking up and extracting your notes. But of course, um, it comes at a cost, which is I think about 15 quid a month. Um, for my part, I've got this for now, and I think I'll review once we go back to normal life and see whether it's still worth me having it. Um, the health warning with Adobe Pro is that it comes automatically with the Adobe Cloud as a download. Um, it seems a real faff to work out whether how to not save things to that, so I just uninstalled the Adobe Cloud because um, I don't want anything on there. So we at Chambers have a GDPR compliant OneDrive that we all use. Um, the other software is PDF Expert, and that's a Mac product. It's really user friendly. You can do a lot of the same stuff. Um, so you can reorder pages, you can merge documents, um, you can do lots of marking up. Um, the redacting, particularly if you, I think you've just got the iPad version, which is a lot cheaper, um, isn't necessarily um, the complete redaction and reliable redaction that you get from the Adobe Pro. So I think just be careful about that. And it doesn't do the OCR but it is cheap. I think on your iPad, it's about 10 quid one off payment. And I think it's more like 60 pounds for desktop. Um, and either of these options, um, if you've got your previous bundle for the last hearing, either of these options are gonna work because you can um, add it, use those to add in any new documents or add them in the back of um, each section. You can take old documents out. You could fill it the bundle to produce a core that's much smaller, so it might be emailable. And if you've got, um, you can actually paginate the documents before you put them in or even just use your iPad pen or by hand um, put in um, pagination and you can put in bookmarks. So I mean, it's, it's not the dream, but it's good enough to get us through what we're doing at the moment. Um, I've had recommended to me Foxit Phantom. Um, I've not used that yet, but I'm gonna have a go at the free trial. Maybe it's something exciting to do over the bank holiday if it rains, um, but that does the OCR. It's very professional and it's a lot cheaper than Adobe. Um, and if you're doing marking up um, on an iPad, um, although on desktop on Windows versions to follow, Liquid Text is excellent. Um, and so if you're starting to work paperlessly, which I think lots of us are at the moment, that's highly recommended. That's all I've got to say on, you'll be pleased to know, on bundling. I don't know if either Caitlin or Matt has anything to add on that. No. No? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Moving on. Um, the next topic is about involving lay parties in the bundle. I think I'm going to try and go through this and then throw to Matthew at the end so I think he will probably have um, some good ideas on how we how we approach this um, and I don't want to be too down about remote hearings I mean, there is a place for it a couple of months ago I did a two-hour PTR with a litigant in person and it worked great judge had a real grip on the case it saved the parents needing a whole day off work it was on time um, and we do see it quite a lot if you're doing high court cases and the judge goes on circuit rather than you're schlepping up to Birmingham, um, you can just turn up or do it from chambers um, and do a phone hearing. And that, that works quite well. I and mean, for us lawyers, um, it's great. So you don't have to leave the house. Um, and also if our Wi-Fi goes down, most of us also have phones you can hotspot to. So we can get through, we can make the best of this. And certainly um, when I've seen lots of tweets and articles about how wonderful this all is and lawyers patting themselves on the back for doing remote hearings um, in private law absolutely um, 
for where parents are represented and it's a short hearing this is an efficient use of resources and I think if you've got wealthy clients doing private FDRs why wouldn't you but the reality for all of us is we're dealing with the most vulnerable people who have complex needs um, and this just isn't going to work um, and so what we're doing is that we've got all the usual hassle of interpreters being late lost documents dodgy pagination and then you've got to factor in your client doesn't have wi-fi or your client's kids are running in and out and how how are they going to do how are they going to make the best of this um, and even in the last two weeks i think things have improved uh, the first hearings i did we were told lay parties couldn't join um, even on the phone which um, is not all right and of course i mean there are of course times you go in advocates only but that's because you've all thought about it and it's been your decision um, but I think that's not happened after the first week. Um, and I think I'm going to go through something, some of the, the worries I've got about this, not necessarily because I've got the answer to it, but I think they're things that we need to bear in mind so that we all, in the way we work, think about the adjustments we can make. Um, tra the Transparency Project um, has a really interesting article about how lay people find it. And many people will have seen um, sort of the, sort of the the good reports about the case of AF, which is a cop case where they, I think it was Mostyn, did a, um, a contested trial and it all went brilliantly as far as the lawyers were concerned. But the article on Transparency Project suggests actually that the layperson, which was AF's daughter, um, really wasn't so great. Um, it's written by sort of someone who was supporting her through that hearing and she felt, she said there was a, she was shocked at the lack of sensitivity and the apparent indifference to um, the layperson's presence. And I think that is probably going to come from the fact that she wasn't visible. Um, the layperson's comments are that Skype took away from me the ability to look these people in the eyes. These people have their opinions about my dad and only knew him through third hand notes. I wanted to look them in the eyes and make them hear the truth, but I was looking at a computer screen. It felt like a second best option. It didn't feel professional. It didn't feel like justice. It felt like a stopgap to ensure a box was ticked rather than a serious and engaged attempt to make decisions about my dad. So I think we're all going to have to do better. The real like, problem for the remote hearings is the loss of being in the room or the loss of co-presence. Um, we all know from when you have occasionally a client on a video link from prison or an expert giving evidence um, by link, it can be a nightmare with the delay, time lags, people set, um, speaking over each other. Um, and now scaling that up. For every participant. We're losing the option for these quiet discussions between advocates. So much gets done in the corridors at court. Um, I say quiet discussions, it's sometimes frank and robust ones. And I can think of times when I've been in a I've been against Matt on a case and he has come in and um, shaken perhaps social workers or parents up um, to actually oh, in a nice different. way. In a nice way, but prompting them to think about it in a way that you just can't do by phone. Um, you also can't have that quiet word with an usher that perhaps your client is having a difficult day. Um, can we either get in or can I send my client home? And I think there's some evidence from the immigration courts that on teleconferencing, lay parties are more likely to disengage. Um, I think that's, that must be right. When we think about our cases. Um, often you'll have a really difficult hearing like an ICO and the judge has done what your client didn't want, which is remove the children. But your client, the judge will speak to your client directly and say, look, this isn't the end. This is the beginning. This is what you need to do. Or if your first experience, as it was for my client last week, from mum, um, is a remote voice taking your child away, how do, you, how do you take that on board? How do you know the judge took it seriously? Um, and how, uh, what does that mean for their future engagement as we go through? Often being at court is the only time you get to take instructions. I mean, plenty of times my client has never um, engaged with the solicitor from one week to the next, but they do come to court. Um, at court, if you're often there for a whole day faffing around, that's where you build up trust. And clients are less likely to give you information just on the phone. And you may be reluctant, I think, to press things because if you can't see the reaction, you can't see how your client's coping and pick up on their nonverbal cues. It can be quite difficult to know, is there more there? And also, and sadly, there are things that if you're not seeing your client, particularly if you're doing a five day hearing over five days, you're not going to see that your client's self harming. I mean, that's you see your client at court and you notice and you can do, take steps like call the GP, ask the social worker for help. And um, I'm not sure quite how we get around those sorts of things. 
Um, I happened to read Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell um, a few months ago, which was all about how we get things wrong and the way we read people and how they act and react and their expressions. I highly recommend it. Although I think in our job, I think we do a bit better at, um, than most in terms of not expecting people to behave in a typical way. But that's going to be so much more so much harder for us when we don't get to know our client or or the witness when it's just a voice or a screen or a quick call as you're ducking in and out and they're also like preparing the children's lunch um rather than the days you spend at court in a room getting to know them and it's going to be really difficult in terms of credibility um it's hard enough for a judge or for any of us to think to work out who's telling the truth and who isn't just from watching them in a witness box but at a proper trial, the judge gets to watch them for several days. How do they, what's their demeanor in court like? What are they? Um, and as an advocate, what are the things you pick up that you might use in submissions about their voice or demeanor? Um, and a lot of that's gonna be lost. I think again, from the immigration courts, there's some evidence that the loss of the nonverbal um, communication has real ramifications for testing evidence and credibility. I think the use of video conferencing has a statistically significant impact on the likelihood of someone being denied asylum. And I think there's a strong argument for us to use in public law is that where credibility is in that in issue, actually we're going to have to go back to face-to-face -to -face trials as soon as possible. Um, His Honour Clifford Bellamy, who's recently retired, had a letter in the Times last week where he talked about, uh, which I think said what a lot of us are feeling about these are draconian powers and these decisions are being taken where you can't look each other in the eye. And this experiment should cease once we return to normal life because we need a proper evaluation on the effects on the vulnerable and those who have the most to lose, namely the children and the families, which is why we're all here. Transparency Project again has an article from an anonymous CJ who really is expressing those concerns. And um, it's the loss of the ability to connect with one another. Um, how do you conduct these hearings with empathy and fairness and understanding which, and compassion, which is what we're all trying to do. One factor that's come up is the loss of gravity because part yes court is scary but actually um there is something about that it, it's a shock to the system of right now i'm going to a courtroom um and that is a big difference for a lot of our clients clients who weren't engaging in plo actually you get to court and it all starts to get real and when we're doing these things remotely it can seem very informal there's the backdrops like looking into someone's living room doorbells dogs barking, advocates chit-chatting. And yet for these um, parents, their children are being taken away. And I know that we as lawyers know we're taking it seriously, but for a lay person, they can feel even more left out. Um, I think impression management is important. Um, and blank backgrounds, if you can put them up, are best. Uh, particularly, I think um, there's that feeling that rich lawyers are even more out of touch um, or and if you can have, I think there was one example of someone having a grand piano in the background, not ideal. Uh, it's not going to make your clients feel that um, you understand them. Um, you also don't want the people being distracted by exciting paintings in the background. Um, and the MOJ version three of the guidance has recognised that and there's now a new paragraph about the decorum of a court hearing should be maintained commensurate with the gravity and seriousness of the issues being decided. Um, and steps need to be taken to avoid matters that detract from that gravitas. And so impression management, so backdrops, being mindful of our language, um, for example, the informal chit chat that you might have at the start of a hearing. Um, I think we also need to manage expectations for our clients and explain to them outside who is who, because they're not going to have the courtroom as the visual guide. So can we do this fairly? I think we have to take a case by case approach. Um, one of the most important things is to be vigilant about potential for unfairness. Is there a risk of interference? Is there someone at home with your client? Um, are they being fed answers? Worse, are they being threatened? I mean, of course, that risk, the risk of threats exists face to face. In the Tolson appeal, um, one of the issues raised was that the father had texted the mother during a hearing with a rape threat if she didn't shut up. That's so much worse if you're away from court and there's no, you she can't tap, show her lawyer um is your client going to tell you these things are happening i mean and how can you spot it if you're doing everything by screen or just by phone um there's also fears i think clients may have that the other side might make a recording are they going to limit what they say 
in evidence? Are they worried about it being published? And of course, yes, this all exists in face-to-face -face hearings, but you tend to see if someone's looking a bit shifty and fiddling with their phone, certainly the judge can, and you tend to grasp it. And I'm not sure um, whether people are going to take heed of these warnings about not loading stuff up on Facebook or not um, publishing things, particularly if we're going to circulate e-documents. Um, the fact is for our clients, they do worry about gossip, they do worry about social media, and rightly so. And so we need to be vigilant about the impact that might be having on how forthcoming our clients are, either in giving us instructions or in their evidence. Um, another factor is for litigants in person, with if they've got a McKenzie friend, um, what's that McKenzie friend doing, particularly while that person's giving evidence? Um, are they passing notes? Because that would be um, unacceptable. So steps we can take um, before court, um, I, uh, Caitlin's already gone through a lot of this, use your advocates meeting, promote your client's interest, start flagging up well in advance. I want this in terms of contact or I need that um, so that the LA can go and get them instructions. Get as much information from your client as you can. They need to know that this isn't going to be like a normal hearing if they know what a normal hearing is. If you're partway through the proceedings where they can tap you on the back or you give them a pen and paper to scribble things down. Um, you need to think about um, how they give you instructions. Can they speak without being overheard? Um, and particularly children who are being set reps um, and they're at home, where can they go? They're not going to school. Where can they go to talk to you? How do they get privacy? When parents are together but separately represented, there might be a conflict. How do you talk privately and how do you give that advice? And we've all given that awful advice of you need to separate or your children are gonna be removed. Um, how, do you, how do you do that? And do it safely if you're, for example, for a mother who's allegedly a victim of domestic abuse, how do you tell her she's got to get out when you know the reality is she's cooped up 24-7 with this person? Um, and you need to make a plan before the hearing for how you're going to get information during it. For an LA, it's pretty easy. Um, social workers generally are near a laptop or a phone. Um, I know earlier this week I got texts and emails from social workers when I was representing them during a hearing, which was excellent. Um, halfway through my submissions up it pops. Um, it was actually better than in real life. I didn't have to turn my back. It was already fed to me. Um, but that's not the same for, for parents. Um, for example, I mean, are you going to give parents your phone, mobile number? I mean, for counsel, the reality is probably not. Um, it's confusing for, lay, for parents to know who the contact as it is, and that's why um, it's always your, your solicitor when we're away from court is the person to contact. And also as, as council we generally only have one phone it's not a work phone and so you don't want that number shared so what else can you do um can you do texting via web or is it going to be a conduit through your solicitor another thing to think about are the emotions of your client if they're sitting at home unsupported potentially alone possibly potentially with children there you can't turn your back or scribble them a note or raise eyebrows or as I do, if I sense a judgment is going our way, but my client might have picked it up, give a thumbs up to reassure them that actually this is all right. And um, you can't do any of that. Um, and so I think there needs to be some sort of system for you to tell, for your client to know um, a way of telling you they're getting overwhelmed and they need a break because breaks are going to be important. I think one thing to think about is, does your client want to or need to join the hearing? Because sometimes they won't. Sometimes they have to balance up actually this is too much um, just like they do at court um, they don't come to court or they say I don't want to come in so think about do they need to join the hearing and if so do they need to join all of it once we're in court um, and ways to help important start is introductions from the judge at the beginning so clients need to know when they can interrupt what they can do if they need to break and to go on mute we need to watch our language I mean the reality is we are having legal arguments a lot of the time and you can't threshold is threshold and we've got to talk about it um, but we've got to be mindful that parents aren't necessarily following that and are they just going to switch off and so how do we temper our language make, make sure we slow down I appreciate I'm now talking at speed because I'm conscious of the time um, and also how do we watch our clients when they're a small box on screen and we're not necessarily monitoring them so as well as listening to the evidence and preparing our next questions. I think we've also got to make sure we can try and see our client on the video and check they're all right. So if they're getting upset, should we ask for a break? I think we do need to insist on breaks. Um, it's 
so often even when you have a client with an intermediary and or you've got a report saying your client needs a break every half an hour how many times has that hearing gone on for an hour and because the judge has said oh do we need a break and your client said oh no i'm all right um no we're gonna have to insist on it for them in terms of technology and our clients and how they can um, get involved i think there are I think, um caitlin's talked about the setting up of booths and the low cost options can the la loan a device as we get through the peak, there will be more we can do. I think um, already, I know um, a solicitor that's planning to have a client come in um, for, to take part in something. So I think if solicitor's offices are open, they might be able to have a client come in so they can give her, he or she can give her evidence from there, or they might be linking from chambers. Also can one, if you've got, for example, um, a prisoner, they can only do video link, that's the reality of it. Um, so in one case, I've got the, father's advocate is going to go to court in person the rest of us are going to be on the phone so that he can be there on the link um, I think other thing to think about is if your client needs help with literacy how are we going to sort out them getting um, help with documents I think that's going to involve um, cons in advance I'm afraid um, which hopefully the legal aid agency are going to be more sympathetic to paying for and I know the FLBA is working with others including the ALC to try and make sure that is done and we need to balance our approach. There are going to be times when we just can't do these hearings. Um, they're not going to be Article 6 compliant. Um, you are not going to get an NHS doctor dragged from the front line to give evidence on your FII in the next few weeks. Um, I've got a final hearing coming up where I'm for the child, but mum has ADHD and a personality disorder. There are findings being sought and she can barely stay in court as it is um, and she needs an intermediary. Um, so none of this is going to happen at the moment. Um, the best will in the world evidence giving evidence will be incredibly difficult for her and the judge has been very accommodating but we're just not going to be able to do that remotely so if in a month's time we're still in lockdown that hearing can't happen and at that point the balance is right well do we do we vacate it in turn and then what does that mean delay potentially for six months at what cost to your client the, the parent who wants a decision or in my case my the child who needs a decision and can we focus on the bigger picture and maybe make some decisions for not all of them? So in that case, the case is overwhelming. On behalf of the child, I want the findings because he needs to, he deserves them. But if it's a case of we have to wait six months, is it actually better to say, well, actually we can make the care order or he can, or not, or he can know where he's going to go and live um, and get the decision he needs. because so we don't actually need those findings. We're thresholds crossed without them. And so that's some of the things we're going to have to grapple with. The two final things in this section are interpreters um, the, and then intermediaries. So interpreters, it's a nightmare. Um, simultaneous interpretation is incredibly difficult. Um, in a case yesterday, we've put recitals in or directions in for the next hearing that there's going to be um, two lines um, with parents and interpreters listening to the hearing by, um, directly by phone but their phone's muted and so the interpreter can then interpret to them separately it's, I mean, it involves someone setting up a second phone line and i have my doubts about whether that's really going to happen um, other options are for people to speak in short bursts and then have interpreters interpret that section or as we did yesterday an agreement actually that everyone would listen and at the end counsel with the interpreter would go through the hearing um, but again, I mean, you couldn't get instructions during the hearing um, and it's very difficult. Um, and there needs to be some sense of how the interpreter can raise their hand to ask people to slow down or clarify or interrupt. One answer is Zoom, because Zoom has an interpreter channel um, and that would allow for separate audio um, for simultaneous interpretation uh, without interrupting the hearing. So if and when HMCTS signs off on Zoom, that does seem like a really good option. And of course, when the person's giving evidence, you just do it um, as you normally would with the um, everyone on the main channel. With intermediaries, um, it seems to me impossible at the moment to do anything like a contested hearing. Um, Community court postponed all assessments because they accept or they say that remote ones cannot be relied upon. I think they're right about that. They're not going to any hearings physically at the moment because they're not key workers and only they're more experienced workers are trained to do some work remotely I think they're going to have two screens um, or failing that a screen with the um, lay client and audio into the hearing 
that how do you work that in real life with your client um, who needs the intermediary particularly if you're you've got parents in the same household and separately represented how many devices this household really have but for short hearings um, and you need ground rules at the outset a really strict reminder about recovery and explanation breaks and that those explanation breaks may well need longer um, and thought about how what tech you're going to use for that explanation break um, and you think you're also cons between the parent and intermediary before the hearing sort of days before and then means to pass a virtual note to the judge again zoom interpreter feature could well be an option um, for um, using intermediaries or potentially the breakout rooms i think i'm i'm not sure i'm as keen on breakout rooms as others are but the interpreter feature could be an option save that i think anyone can listen to the interpreter channel so you just need to be careful about what's being said but that's the end of my part on that. I don't know if Matt's got stuff to add. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I haven't done anything with inter, in, intermediaries or interpreters, but I'm a bit worried about doing that on a telephone. I just, I, I can just see lots of problems with that. I mean, at Kafkas, what we've been doing is when we've been having to adjourn anything, we've been make, there's been, we've been noting on our system about adjourning cases due to COVID-19. And we've been we've been marking down that they're, we're also having remote hearings. So when we look back, we know what's happened in these cases. So we're recording all of that. Um, with my current cases, they're slightly easier because I can triage them, speak to the local authority, social worker, speak to my solicitor, the children's solicitor, and say, look, we're not really going to get this um, assessment of, in, of the grandparents in the Philippines or wherever. That's not going to happen um is it you know should we should we try and adjourn this off you know because you know that's just not that's not going to happen so those cases that i've got are quite easy to to look at and i have some cases where the parents have cognitive issues and i you know i really worry about those ones and i think i worry about the lack of agency that we all have as professionals about being able to make a, a difference by i think as victoria said physically being there at times guardians we're used to more remote working and not often always being there but there are times when we we are there and we do make a, a difference by physically, you know, just talking to a parent or and 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 that's we've lost that, which is a, a real worry. My big concern is about new cases where these you know these families and these children have no idea what the court is because you know cases that are going on or reappointments they've kind of got an idea what the family court setup is. If you're brand new to the family court, that's going to be really quite strange to be doing it over the phone um so i think that's a real challenge for anyone work any professional working to try and explain what it's going to be like for them and that will be part of our responsibility as guardians and for the social workers and solicitors and barristers to try and explain to people what it's like i was thinking particularly as well um young people that i work with uh, deprivation of liberties um, those kind of um, young people who who have the right to be in court, um, you know, it's going to be difficult for them. Sometimes if they they are put in a secure, then they might have some video conferencing. But I think again, their their ability to to be able to participate is a real concern uh, for me. And we've just at Kafkas, we've just had some information from CFAB about um, overseas assessments as well that I'll make sure that we forward on somehow but I, I think it is concerning how we we sort of empower the children and families that we work with normally and although we're trying to do business as usual it feels a bit like a holding pattern to me um when we and i think we're going to talk about assessments in a bit but that's that's sort of my concerns all right i think we're moving on to the next topic which is you caitlin here we go um yeah so assessments i um just had a little look at in terms of really where um yeah where any can be done frankly um at the moment um certainly i think there's a limited uh, expectation that these are to be um certainly uh, conducted by way of face-to-face uh, -face, um, involvement. Um, I'm just gonna see if I can share the screen. Um, 
So yeah, um, the obviously with um, social distancing, safe social distancing, it, it's a key uh, consideration uh, as to how you're going to be able to assess anybody. Um, Victoria told me that in fact there are still some uh, ISWs that are prepared to undertake um, risk assessments um, and that they would use PPE to do this. Um, it, just, it just doesn't feel right, does it, being assessed by somebody in a face mask. But uh, that said, if that is the only way that you think that you can progress a case that requires that type of assessment, that requires progression, that you can um, certainly do um, as much as you can, then yeah, I mean, look into it. Um, I think that in uh, as things uh, go on, we are very unlikely to have uh, assessments that involved any type of face-to-face -face contact um, and obviously we've got no uh, particular end in sight with the lockdown so how are assessments to be conducted if they're not to be done face-to-face -face? well what I um, put on the um, the screen is in the first instance ensure close liaison with the assessor understand how they intend to undertake it. What's the likely nature? Is it going to be face-to-face -face or is it going to be a remote platform that's used? Um, and my recommendation is that you err on the side of caution when considering assessments. That where before you may not have done, you provide a comprehensive Plan. You provide the details, the dates, the times when contact is going to be made. You give in advance the outline, the topics. You look at what it is that you're going to be discussing. How is homework going to be conducted? If it's an, an assessment that requires that type of engagement, then be as explicit as you can. Um, because obviously, again, it comes down to preparation. The more that somebody is aware of how something's going to be done, what's going to be done, the more valuable information that you are likely to uh, receive from a, a, a remotely conducted assessment. Um, yeah, give your realistic timetables when you're uh, grappling with how you're going to undertake assessments. Uh, and a key point is how are you going to do parenting assessments when you are obviously wanting to look at parenting strengths, parenting weaknesses, but um, when a child's in foster care and there's no contact and you can't provide for the hands-on observations, absolutely key elements to any fair assessment. How are you going to do it? Um, I think it's less problematic for viability assessments, um, for kinship assessments, um, but looking at parenting assessments, clearly it, it presents such a level of challenge. Um, the understand experts, um, for example, psychiatrists, psychologists, there are still um, experts that are in a position to undertake assessments. Um, if you are thinking about uh, that sort of um, assessment in this, uh, obviously these extraordinary times, then I would suggest that you um, have a very close level of liaison with them in advance of putting them forward. Be clear about how they're going to do this. Be clear about what they're going to do. Um, be clear in your part 25 how that sort of assessment is going to be conducted. Um, and ultimately, listen, be realistic. If there is no fair, no acceptable way of actually undertaking an assessment call, um, you've got to be candid. If it cannot be done, then just don't bother. Um, you are really, you're going to throw good money after bad if you are engaging or looking to engage in an assessment that is so manifestly unfair. 
that is so unfit for purpose that when it comes to reliance on it, you know it's going to get torn to shreds and, and you know that you can't rely on it. So um, look at these things, discuss them with team management, involve lawyers if you think that's appropriate, um, and really grapple with what it is you're trying to achieve through assessments. Perhaps less um, difficulty, uh, there are still uh, drug testing labs that are uh, able to, um, I think, take samples. <laughs> Be cutting their own hair and handing it over. Um, but there are means that you can undertake hairstrand testing. Uh, and clearly that is something I would say can be done fairly uh, and proportionately. So do uh, look at those websites uh, and uh, do liaise obviously with parents solicitors about how you'd conduct that. But that does seem to be something that is uh, still ongoing. Um, so yeah, that's really as much as I want to say about assessments. Uh, you really have to focus on their fairness uh, and if they're worth it, they are. Um, I'm just going to um, hand that out to uh, both Victoria uh, and Matt to see whether they want to use as well. Yeah, just on the hair strand test, I think I know Alpha Biolabs, who are putting big ads on the Family Law Week um, weekly email, are turning up and go with PPE and going on the doorstep and either cutting the hair or watching it being cut. But I think on behalf of your clients you have to risk assess for them i have a client who's got health needs that are such that she's been told she can't travel to contact even if we put lots of precautions around it and so on her behalf we have said well we don't need her hair strand test to be taken right now she's accepted using x amount leave it at that and um, in the six weeks or eight weeks if we can get if it's safer we'll do it then but otherwise i'm not putting her health at risk because there's no PPE for her. Um, so oh. Then you have to look at, oh, also um, the other thing is options for like, things like psychologists and doing that remotely. One option is potentially for um, clients to go to the solicitor's office and do it that way. So they're in somewhere quiet. Um, and again, it might, that may well be good enough for some clients. It might necessarily be for doing um, all the cognitive tests, but for example, if you need a capacity assessment um, or something to inform whether you need a PANS assessment, you may get enough um, to mean that you can actually get going and that you only build in an eight week delay rather than actually nothing happening at all. So that's all I would add on the conducting assessments. Um, I've done a couple of talks for the ALC about um, young people in capacity. Um, and I think something for guardians and children's solicitors when dealing with um, young people who may have the capacity to instruct directly is it's I think it's going to be really hard to do it over the phone you could maybe do it with a video call or something but I think that's it that's going to be in this time until we are out of this a real issue I've had a couple of cases with teenagers my two, the only two cases I've had um, recently and they're both teenagers and luckily through sort of persuasion they've agreed to they haven't they haven't um disagreed with me so that actually separation hasn't been an issue but i on one of the cases the child does want to go and live back with her mother and at, at some point if i don't agree we will separate but the solicitor is in difficulties doing that assessment that that, that she needs to do of the young person so I think that's one thing to think about how we we do that and think about, you know, because that was the judgment from um, Mr. Justice Williams, you know, he didn't foresee this, you know, he had all these good things that you need to do, but he didn't foresee uh, this pandemic. Um, I've, in the other cases that I've had, uh, or in those cases, we've we've listed psycho psychologists and assessment at the Eva Armsby, I'll give them that way, that's Tar Hamlet's. Um, and, that's I think well and good but I'm I'm really worried about how effective they're going to be in in the case that the mother doesn't have a smartphone so how she could have a psychiatric assessment over the phone I'm not really sure and how the psychologist is going to see the child and parent interaction when the child's not living with her I can't see that happening so although we're going through the motions of doing it I wonder whether it's, I think I use this for my team meeting and my uh, team manager who's on the line will 
correct me if I'm wrong, I said it was like a false economy that we're doing this and we're perhaps going to have to go back and do all these again because it's perhaps not fair because if it comes out one way that someone doesn't like, then we're just going to have to rehash it. So I'm not sure what the answer is there. But I think we're sort of, again, going about business as usual, listing to IRH and evidence. And I wonder whether that's actually um, going to be possible. Um, of course, I write assessments and, and, and analysis. Um, we're put Kafkas, we're going to have a special little paragraph saying we've had to do all this remotely. Um, and of course, if it's a teenager, I can talk to them over the phone. Um, Kafkas have published some advice, uh, not published, internal advice about how we use Skype to talk to young people um, and do direct work. But again, I think that, you know, there's that sense of agency when we're with them actually doing the drawing. We're in the house. We can smell things. We can see things that's beyond the screen. You know, you can't see how messy my house is over there or here you can't quite hear my daughter singing along to Mamma Mia because I just walked out and told him to be a bit quieter but you lose that I mean smell if you're a social worker that's a big thing you know smelling things and seeing what's this so I, I worry about the work I can do my analysis how I can really do that because I think the best ones I write are the ones where I've actually gone out and done some work we could all do it on paper um, but I don't think that's that is as effective as we can be. So that's that's my worry is that for the next few weeks or maybe months, we do we're sort of going ahead of things and perhaps we're gonna have to just do it all again, which is gonna increase this huge, I think this backlog that we think is gonna happen in September. So we're gonna be really busy. Um, I think that's it for my assessment. All right, so we we'll move on to the next topic, which is child protection and how we try and manage that during COVID-19. I think there are two things I'm going to talk about in this bit. One is about LAs and getting their statutory duties and the second is contact because I know that's a real issue um, mm. for everybody. Um, there is some government guidance and I'll send the link around that's being updated that sort of acknowledges that LAs will want to comply with their statutory duties as far as they can but there will be times when that's not possible. Um, I think when that is the case, you've got to make sure there's management oversight and you've got to have record keeping that includes the rationale for why you've deviated from standard practice or statutory requirements. Um, got to make sure that decisions are child-centred, risk-based, family-focused, informed by evidence, collaborative and transparent. I think really it's about a sensible risk-based approach to where you focus your activity. Um, for social workers, what is their caseload? Where are the risks highest? That's where you do the most visits. Um, and while LAs have duties to their staff as critical, who are critical workers, ultimately those procedures um, need to stay in place for the scrutiny and welfare of children. So when looking at whether to visit, um, there are the risks to the ch child or young person, the risk to their family, and then the risk to the workforce. And there are ways other than face-to-face -face for doing your visits um, sometimes like with an older child. Um, is this a child who will call you if there's a problem? Um, some children have a really good relationship with their social workers and, and will text and sort of say, oh, mum's kicked off or there's a problem. Um, likewise, an older child, you may be able to do your visit by phone or Skype. Um, do you have the safeguard of that child going to school? Um, if you need to go into the home, follow the PHE guidance and try and get some PPE, although I think, I'm not sure how quickly that's getting to local authorities for social workers. But where there's a home with suspected COVID-19, they should be wearing PPE. Um, there is, obviously families are going to be worried about people coming to their home and um, reassurance can be offered. Um, but I'm mean also in the back of your mind, is that refusal for the social worker to come in based on a genuine concern about COVID or is it some other obstruction? Um, it may be that you're not going to be able to do the full visit with the direct work you normally would. It might be that you just see the children at the front door. Um, but you need to look at um, what are the risks. Likewise, if you're um, advising or strongly advising, requiring vulnerable children to go to school, um, what is the health profile of that family and child? Um, what are the supports at home for a child, for example, on an um, education health um, plan is there learning or stimulation at home 
um, there needs to be a balance. Um, some children will be fine at home, others won't. And if the parents are reluctant to send them, we need to think about why. We need to look at multi-agency support and how much can be delivered remotely, and particularly drug and alcohol services. Can those key workers do sessions by phone? Um, can uh, core groups be convened by phone? And of course, there is that reminder that for child safety purposes, social workers can share information. If they're worried about that, they need to be contacting legal because GDPR um, and Data Protection Act don't stop, don't require them not to do that. But ultimately, we're just going to have to try and do our best. Um, one of the issues I think that's going to be cropping up is what we do with foster carers and residential units, particularly as people fall ill. What do you do if the foster carer is vulnerable health-wise? Um, I think in that case, you're going to be looking at virtual schools rather than the child going in. Respite foster care is likely to be more limited. And social workers are going to have to be proactive with liaising with residential units or children's homes or residential schools or semi-independent accommodation about what their procedures are, what happens if they have shortages of staff. Um, and from what I've seen, a lot of those units I think are already being proactive. Um, certainly a semi-independent accommodation, there are some was placed this week that I was involved in. They already had their plan. The young mums aren't going out. It's the workers who are going to go and do the shopping. So there are things they're doing there. Um, the government guidance in this area is a bit of a fudge and hopefully it will be updated, but um, I, they haven't really addressed um, what you're going to do if you need to place a child somewhere and it's not approved because it says do your best, but there is no sign off on unregulated placements. But hopefully there will be an update on that. And one practical option that's been raised is um, whether foster carers who might be approved for two children, can that approval be lifted? increase to a third child and it's going to have to be a balance and see where we get to but there are practical things that um, we can do like for example in our cases how do you do a, a removal if there's an ICO one I had last week the social worker waited in the taxi and it was a slightly older child so child walked from home front door to the taxi and then at the other end from the taxi to the um, foster carers home by themselves with the parent or foster parent monitoring either end but the social worker not going to the home and then doing the placement planning meeting remotely. Another case, a mother took a baby to a mother and baby unit unescorted, but in a taxi with another taxi being arranged for, to follow with belongings later on. So we're going to have to just be pragmatic and try and do the best we can. In terms of contact, um, the fostering network's view um, is very much everyone should stay at home. Um, and we'll do the best of it with video calls and phone calls and social media. Um, and I think, I, I think they're wrong about that, frankly. It might be fine for an older child. That might be fine for a child who's in long-term foster care where contact's every two months and they, you could do a call to reassure them that mum or dad is okay and then make up that contact in a month's time, if things are lifted. But the government guidance is much clearer and that's that they expect contact to continue. It's essential. And actually not seeing relatives is harmful itself or can be traumatising. And so there is an expectation for assessment on a case-by-case -case basis and taking into account needs of the child, health needs of the family and social distancing guidance. And the reality is you're not going to have, it would seem, your face-to-face -face contact in the way you normally would. Um, and some of it will have to be replaced virtually. But we need to be looking at the spirit of the contact that's in place and looking at what, what you can do. And if there is a newborn baby, as came, um, I represent a newborn baby this week, and she's being moved to foster care, and the LA has no plan for physical contact at all. And on her behalf, this little baby, um, yes, there is the risk to her of COVID-19, but there's also the risk to her from having no contact at all with her mother. Um, no smell, no bonding, overfeeding, nothing. And that is a harm. And so they're, they're going to have to be some way to grapple with there being some direct contact. Um, and the court agreed, although none of us can really force the LA to do anything. But yes, video calls or phone pictures might be fine for a couple of times a week, but if it's only, even if it's only once a week, there has to be something. Because for that baby, um, it's going to be awful for her um, to never bond with her mother. Um, and so what can you do in terms of deep cleaning contact rooms, observing PHE guidance on social distancing? Um, so I think LAs are going to have to grapple with that. Where children are older, um, 
we can be creative in terms of virtual contact and five minutes on the phone with a three-year-old is going to be boring for the child and not going to get you anywhere but um zoom again or house party whatever the one it is um there's loads you can do um you can have a meal together kids can watch a movie or cartoons you can do a puzzle there are lots of things that can be done particularly I mean, in family placements a lot more freedom but i've got one case where the children are in separate placements from each other and from their parents I think, well hang on this is this is what zoom's made for we can all they can get together and all watch a cartoon and it's not the same as seeing mum and having a cuddle but it's better than just being on the phone um but again, that's going to involve some help from la's in terms of sim cards or tech both for foster carers and for the parents of course foster carers won't want their numbers shared and so you might need sim cards or some new email addresses and some practical advice to foster carers for example having the device in a fixed place if they're worried about their location being given away but that's all from me. I don't think Matt might have something to add on this one. Yeah, a, a little bit. I think as a guardian, and I think some of my other colleagues, guardians in, in my team, we're trying to be as collaborative as possible with the local authorities, with the social workers and help them out because, you know, we, we, we were all social workers. And I think they have a real challenge um, working, doing visits remotely, managing not, not just those cases that are in court or on the PLO, but also child in need, child protection. You know, that's such a challenge to these already kind of overworked social workers now. Um, so, I, you know, I've, I've been really impressed with the, the six the boroughs that I work with in East London. You know, those social workers have really risen to the challenge. Um, I've no idea if they have any protective um, clothing or anything to go and actually do visits because that's the problem. As I think I said earlier, you know, doing a Skype call, doing a video call or standing on the doorstep is not really going to get you an understanding and we know that with the schools closed you know they were safe places for for children um they were places we got referrals from and we know that domestic abuse is is rising rapidly whilst everyone is locked in so that's a real concern for me about how those local those local authority social workers are supported and as much as i can do and much as the other guardians that i work with are doing i think we're trying to support our our colleagues um in social work um i was thinking you know there's those children in the lift best project from that we're running in east london you know they're, they're you know I'm, I'm not sure i don't have an answer for this but i'm not sure how that's going to be working where these these children have been separated and they're going to go through this process i don't know how that's working through whether they're still going um i think it's probably really important that if cases do come into court the written agreements that we're always writing are going to be really vital in kind of really being clear what what contact arrangements are and and what the child protection is um, for when we sort of show the court and get them approved because often you know we just talk about tight written agreements but they really do have to be tight and take into account what's going on um, I think that's it on my child protection I just think it's really challenging it's just incredibly challenging to do child protection at the moment right, I think that final topic then is Caitlin um so I, it's a, probably most of this has been covered if i'm brutally honest um but i just put together um what we've termed risks outside the court arena um and they are things that we've already um, thought about and touched on but Obviously, these are extraordinary times. They will pass, um, but we are literally in the thick of it at the moment. Uh, and as been mentioned by both Victoria uh, and uh, Matt, they are um, issues that were live before and have now become um, livid. Um, it's right to say that there's already been uh, a significant increase in recordings of domestic violence. I heard that it's 25% increase. Um, I've got a link actually to a very helpful article um, that because obviously we know that as this is increasing there is in tandem with that um, a more limited ability for victims to flee uh, the um, uh, unsafe and dangerous uh, conditions. Um, so you've got this obviously this toxic marriage but what I'd seen within this article is that it offers up um, very hands-on uh, assistance and support 
Um, it talks about, amongst other things, um, the silent solution system. So that's where you phone the police and you can then dial 55 and they know the situation you find yourself in. So there are um, a number of projects um, that are certainly looking at protecting um, victims in those circumstances. So I would, I'll put that link on, um, as I say, I think it's helpful, uh, particularly for social workers um, and indeed solicitors uh, representing their clients. Um, obviously alcohol misuse is going um, through the roof, uh, difficulties uh, in lockdown. There are, um, just for people's reference, you can get um, both AA meetings, NA meetings, you can get 12 step uh, recovery programs online. They use Zoom. Um, and it may be that if there are these difficulties, you can just update clients, let them know um, obviously how to uh, avail themselves of services. Um, and of course, these are all additional worries, um, as Matt touched on. There is much less of an opportunity for external monitoring of children, schools, health visitors, nurseries, extended family members. This is all gone. Um, and of course, that raises our anxiety in, in terms of child protection. Um, and as that's happening, obviously, the front line is so significantly depleted. Um, people are obviously having to social distance, isolate themselves, got their own childcare problems. So you've got this um, pretty much um, a toxic uh, cocktail of um, raised anxieties and a, a lessened frontline staff. So um, what can we do? Well, we know that numbers are going to increase whilst we're in lockdown. Uh, and my advice to local authorities and to solicitors is begin your preparations now. Uh, have your uh, procedures in place to deal with the increasing numbers of families that are likely to come through to the system. Maintain very close links with the police. Maybe a time to revisit um, and make yourself aware of any updated guidance on uh, police protection. Uh, what are the protocols? Are they standing up to scrutiny in the current times? Uh, is this the opportunity to go uh, and obviously have liaison with your Kate teams? Um, really to look at the infrastructure as it exists in the current time. Is it fit for purpose? Um, other handy tips. Um, keep abreast of the latest guidance from the courts uh, and from the professional bodies. Um, I mean, it may be worth considering just appointing a member of your team uh, to access updates, to summarise them, to make sure they're distributed. Um, yeah, stay abreast of the guidance, stay abreast of professional opinions and the circulating views and an ever-changing uh, and shifting uh, dynamic and perspective out there. Um, reach out to your colleagues, reach out to other boroughs, um, involve other firms, get your, um, you know, really get an understanding of how people are managing. Um, because we know this will come to an end, but whatever we can be doing now to keep business as usual is, of course, uh, hugely beneficial um, for what comes on the other side. Um, and, yeah, speaking for us as a Chambers, um, Quorum, I hope, has a, um, a reputation of going the extra mile, of being um, able uh, to try and sort things out for you. Um, our clerks team remains um, obviously working from home, but very, very hands on. So I guess really we are here to help. Um, and um, as we've been taking questions, I can see that the chat box has been pinging along. Um, so that's everything from me, but I'm just going to ask uh, Victoria and Matt um, just to add to any of the uh, risks that they say uh, exist, obviously, um, in the current times. Nothing from me. I think you've covered it all. Thanks, Caitlin. I mean, I, I, I would say, you know, the police are going to be, I suspect, in the next few weeks under a lot of pressure. So 
that's a worry. I mean, uh, Caitlin said about health visitors, if we think about they would they'd be going in often to see the children, you know, they'd be the front line. And I don't think, I don't know whether they're even going in at the moment, whether they have protection. Um, so that that's a worry. I think the schools, I, I'm a school governor and um, I know just the week, I think the week beginning the 16th, before the school shut, the, the secondary school in where I live in Hackney, on the Monday, it was a 70% attendance. And by Wednesday, it got down to 30% attendance. And that was before they'd shut the schools. That was for people taking their own decision not to send their children. And I had a conversation with my wife this morning about if they reopened the schools, because they decided to, because there was a UCL report about how it doesn't make much difference. I'm not sure how many people may send their children anyway until there's a clear, you know, clear evidence and a clear exit strategy. So I think those, you know, that they're obviously that's a bigger picture that we have to deal with, but there it's not necessarily that people will just send their kids back to school. And I think there is the stuff around county lines, kids are out there. Um, doing stuff and you know there's no one monitoring them so that's they're all the kind of worries that I have I think that's it for me I think that's everything we had to say I think Rakaya was going to see if there was any questions I appreciate we've gone on a bit longer than we said we would Kel surprise it involved me talking um <laughs> yeah well exactly, yeah, exactly. we're only half an hour over <laughs> Well, there's been quite a lot of chat going back and forth, um, mostly just comments. I haven't seen any questions that haven't been answered. So if anybody does have any burning questions, please do um, use the chat function right now. And otherwise, if something crops up later, by all means, email Caitlin or I. We're happy to try and field what we can. <laughs>